Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Human Rights Foundation's Protest in the Age of Surveillance online panel. We hope everyone is staying safe and healthy. My name is Jenny Wang, and I'm from the Human Rights Foundation, an international nonprofit based in New York that promotes and protects human rights in countries with authoritarian regimes. I will be your moderator for this timely panel today. First, I would like to give a shout out to South by Southwest. We were really excited and looking forward to going to the conference this year in Austin. It's unfortunate that this virus has evolved into a global pandemic, but we're glad that we are able to still have this panel for all of you here online today. In case you missed it, last year, the Human Rights Foundation had the amazing opportunity to host a panel about the usage of technology on a major unfolding and ongoing human rights crisis in East Turkestan, better known as China's Xinjiang province on the Uyghur Muslims. The discussion highlighted how China's AI, big data analysis, facial recognition, movement tracking, and extensive social credit system are all used by the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, to control and surveil innocent civilians ultimately infringing on their basic human rights and privacy. This invasive surveillance technology baked into cell phones, apps, tablets, is also being used to promote state propaganda in China and to silence all dissent. Such emerging technology that we discussed at South by Southwest last year is still very highly relevant today around the world. We have an absolutely stellar group of panelists here today in Hong Kong to help us unpack and understand this ongoing and important topic. We'll be exploring the roles of technology, both the negative and the positive, and how they play out in protests and social movements. Our panelists will share their insights about this intersection based on their experiences in Hong Kong. We have Mary Hui, Hong Kong-based reporter for Quartz. She primarily covers Asia business and geopolitics, and also has done extensive reporting on the pro-democracy demonstrations in Hong Kong. We have Nathan Law, founding chairperson of Demosisto, which is a pro-democracy youth activist group in Hong Kong. Nathan was one of the student leaders of the 2014 Umbrella Movement. And at the age of 23, he was the youngest elected lawmaker ever in Hong Kong's history, but was forcefully unseated due to Beijing's pressure. And lastly, we have Denise Ho, an award-winning Hong Kong-based canto pop singer, songwriter, and pro-democracy activist. She was a strong supporter of the 2014 Umbrella Movement and was arrested for her involvement. Since then, the Chinese government, the CCP, has banned her from performing in China. Denise Ho is also one of our Oslo Freedom Forum speakers. She has delivered remarks at the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, as well as the Congressional Executive Commission on China in Washington, D.C. I will first give each of the panelists a few minutes for introductory remarks, and then we will have a moderated conversation. Um, let's start with Mary. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I think what I'd like to start off by saying is uh, the protests of uh, 2019 in Hong Kong, even though uh, we may not be seeing images of large scale uh, demonstrations on the streets, the protest movement um, is not circumscribed by what we see on, on, on the street scene. Uh, we have to place a lot of emphasis on the movement part of it, and that movement is still very much alive um, and continuing grievances of the protesters have yet to be addressed uh, by by the government here um, and, and the underlying themes and questions are still very much running through uh, the very core of Hong Kong society so even though we may not be seeing the images um, that so gripped um, the world's imagination last year with images of millions of people crowding the streets marching to demand democracy uh, protesters clashing with the police and the like. Um, the movement right now is taking a very different form. It may be more muted uh, physically. We may not be seeing um, as gripping and graphic images, but uh, the, the questions and the energy um, and, and the aspirations that so drive the protesters are still very much there. And, and that's something we, we should keep in mind as a pandemic uh, sweeps the world and may direct um, attention um, uh, elsewhere, very rightfully so, um, as uh, we deal with a, a public health crisis of uh, immense proportions. Um, but while we think about the Hong Kong protest movement in 2019 and now onwards in 2020, that's definitely something to keep in mind. Um, and so when people talk about the new normal now of pre-COVID-19 and post-COVID-19, 
And that's also a question that I think a lot of Hong Kongers uh, have dealt with. Um, even months before uh, coronavirus uh, swept the world, people talked about the, the new normal now that the protest movement um, has uh, taken off in, in Hong Kong. And so right around kind of towards the end of 2019, people were talking about what the new normal is uh, after months of uh, large scale protests, whether relations between uh, family members, between friends, between civilians and police, between uh, the citizens and, and the government will ever be the same again. And obviously the answer is no, nothing will ever be the same again after what happened last year. And the question is, uh, what will the next months and years to come look like? Will um, freedoms continue to be eroded uh, by, by China um, through uh, the actions of the Hong Kong government and of course uh, the Chinese government here? Um, or will the protesters be able to uh, to acquire uh, and gain some of what they uh, so are, are asking for. Um, and so one, uh, one image of a graffiti um, uh, tagline that made the rounds last year on, um, on social media uh, goes like this. It says, uh, we can't return to what, uh, to, we can't return to the normal because what was normal was precisely the problem. And I think that phrase really captures uh, the energy of what uh, many, many people feel, that there was this huge, uh, for lack of a better word, there was, a, there was a huge revolution in the sense that so many things have been turned on their heads, so many things are now different about Hong Kong society and politics. Um, and, and we're very much in the new normal, both in the protest sense, and now of course, the coronavirus, and, and the question of what that new normal will look like, um, how we continue to shape um, the future that is to come, is, is a huge, um, is a huge question that looms over everyone uh, with a stake in this. Wait, wait, wait. Um, and so I think another question that we want to look at is um, how technology plays a role um, in, in this age of uh, uh, surveillance and mass protests. Um, and I think from what we've seen in Hong Kong is that from the very beginning, protesters uh, have been acutely aware of the need to take um, their digital security very uh, very seriously. Um, not just digital security, but just in general, how to make sure that um, they're not being uh, tracked down. Um, so for example, at the beginning, we saw a lot of protesters pay for train tickets uh, with coins instead of uh, with their prepaid um, uh, octopus cards, so uh, metro cards uh, that you can pay uh, your public transportation rides with. And that was a way of using just old fashioned cash to try and minimize the amount of tracking. Um, they also, uh, protesters also used real-time uh, updated maps um, to show the movement of protesters, where tear gas is fired. And so there were these a lot of ways of using and harnessing the power of existing technologies in, in creative ways. I don't think necessarily there were um, very new technologies um, being invented. It was just a, a way of really resourcefully uh, deploying what was already at hand to um, kind of corral a lot of people um, and, and minds um, in a limited time to uh, maximum effect. And um, as we go forward now, I think one key question is how do protesters keep up with uh, securing their use of technology? Um, earlier in January of this year, um, there were two uh, judicial reviews filed um, over the police use of vague um, uh, umbrella search warrants to crack into thousands of phones that were confiscated uh, from uh, people arrested in relation to the protests. And the question of how um, uh, the data that is then this, uh, extracted from these phones are used, uh, whether they are ever um, presented in court as evidence uh, to press charges against people involved with the movement, that uh, um, remains to be seen. Um, but according to the court filings, a lot of these uh, warrants uh, weren't very specific. They didn't um, name exactly which devices they wanted. To, uh, the police wanted to um, access, or who they belonged to, or even why exactly the devices needed to be cracked into. Um, the the warrants themselves actually gave the police access and authority to search their own premises, uh, their own headquarters, where the phones were very very conveniently brought. Um, and so those um, judicial review hearings are ongoing, uh, but I think that 
um, that question of uh, you know just how much um, how many techno technological um, security um, and precautions you take, whether those uh, will matter if the state has so much power to um, just take control of your technological devices and, and crack into um, the information that you have on them. And so just kind of very broadly, just to recap then, um, I think what we have to realize is, or, or remember is that this is an ongoing movement. Um, we may see action return to the street. We may not in, in the same way as last year, but the movement is still very much ongoing. Um, the use of technology, I think we have to keep an eye on. Um, and right now with uh, the pandemic, uh, I think we are seeing an increase, uh, increasing, um, increasingly forceful crackdown from, uh, from China and of course Hong Kong government too, as the world has their attention elsewhere. And so um, as to how that will continue, uh, I think we should also pay close attention to that. Thank you, Mary. I absolutely agree. When millions of people took to the streets in Hong Kong over the summer, it definitely gripped the attention of the global community. And I like how you mentioned how the energy is ongoing and continuous. And we definitely feel that, especially as people are still protesting online virtually as well in this pandemic. I like how you mentioned how tech plays a role and how protesters are acutely aware of limiting their digital footprint. This is something that we'll definitely return to in a bit during our moderated conversation. Nathan, would you like to go next with intro remarks? Yes, definitely. Uh, thank you um, for the invitation. And building up on uh, the opening statement from Mary, I think um, the way we're moving forward um, is that um, we've got a lot of different front lines that we have to focus on rather than on the street, because it's been a year since the massive demonstration last year um, in June, which uh, literally opened up the whole um, anti-extradition movement. And uh, we, we've got scenes uh, from the past few months that captured the, the, the attention of the world, like firing petrol bombs, uh, millions of people marching down to the street. And uh, the resistance now has um, converted into a more subtle form because of the emergence of COVID-19 and the global pandemic and the banning on the group gathering. So I think um, there are several fun lines still ongoing and the energy is still there, but it, it's just not in uh, the uh, visible form as we have had for the past few months uh, before the global pandemic. And the first one I think um, which is really important is the election front line. Mm -hmm. We will be having um, the Legislative Council in September, uh, which we are going to run in a undemocratic uh, de design of system in Hong Kong because we've only got around half of the seats are through that election and the other half most of them are reserved for the probation camp. So uh, if, uh, the, uh, uh, if the pandemocrats, uh, which they uh, were, have been having a majority in terms of the popular vote, but, uh, but always a minority inside the chamber due to the very peculiar design of the system that is tilted towards the probation, the conservative camp, um, we wanted to fight a miracle that we wanted to win as much seats as possible and then to gain uh, over half of the seats in the Legislative Council and see how Beijing reacts. Mm -hmm. So um, I think this is one of the front lines that we all, uh, Hong Kong people, collectively preparing for. And uh, a miracle is pending to happen. I hope that it will happen because it is important for us um, that we um, actually challenge the power Beijing has because um, Beijing has always been concentrating all the powers, including legislative one. And if we really raise a lot of challenges on that, um, their reaction would definitely be massive, but also nasty. So that by then we could induce mistakes from them and then we could react upon that. So I think um, this is one of the front line that we're looking forward. And the other one is on the economic side because um, for us, um, Hong Kong people has like huge consuming power and we had, we're well, like money is actually one of our weapons. So for now, we've got a yellow economic cycle, a circle that um, yellow is actually the, the, the symbolic color for the uh, pro-democracy camp that we uh, symbolize um, that uh, we consume on the basis of uh, an agreed uh, political belief. So mm -hmm. we go shop and eat 
at the restaurants or at the stores that um well sig uh, signifies them themselves as a yellow store which is a pro democracy pro protest stores and mm -hmm. then we tried to to do it um to accumulate um more economic power within our own camp in order to like hamper the development of the the other side but also strengthening ourselves and we urge all these stores to um return or to um uh, reciprocate to the movement by hiring uh, like convicted protesters or donating to um, all the organizations that um, that they need funding for continuing their protests. So we are building up a uh, uh, economic uh, circle uh, and habitat uh, or can or organic um, interactions within uh, the camp in order to boost its power in terms of its economic um, side. Mm -hmm. And the third one would definitely be the legal side, because there are a lot of cases being brought to the courts. And the, the rule of law and the independence of the legal system in Hong Kong has been challenged by uh, the Beijing, because they have always wanted to control all the um, sectors in Hong Kong, including the judiciary run. And um, in accordance to the policy enacted in mainland China, which Xi Jinping has always been commenting on uh, the legal system in China is not going to follow the Western separation of power and the rule of law system. Um, and we are worried that that kind of um, mindset will be transplanted to Hong Kong and we will lose independence of judi our judi judiciary system and also the trust of Hong Kong people towards the court and the mm -hmm. judges. So um, whether the verdict in the future on the political um, activists are compelling and legitimate and um, convincing all the public that we still got a certain degree of rule of law will be one of the key issue in the future and a lot of legal protectionists like uh, the lawyers barristers that cooperating with us will be um, defending the system and trying to outline all the principles that we have on courts but i think uh, the future of our courts is quite dim because under the influence of China, the comprehensive jurisdiction that they uphold, um, that they wanted uh, the our judiciary system to be subsumed or at least to kowtow to the system has been very clear. So we are all very anxious about like whether our court can bear the pressure and to make a just um, verdicts or remain a certain degree of independence in the future. So I think these are the like front lines that we are very aware of and the, the energy that used to be put on the street are being channeled to these um sectors mm -hmm. and i think uh for us we're we're pretty much still got the momentum and mm -hmm. still ongoing but i think yeah the energy is, is just spent on elsewhere mm -hmm. thank you nathan i think for all of us witnessing even if we're not in hong kong we are also worried about the erosion of rule and law in Hong Kong because it's being challenged by Beijing. But I do like how you mentioned how these two things, the elections in September at the LECO and the yellow economic cycle really shows the ground up creative collaborative energy that the Hong Kongers have and keeping the momentum going, even though COVID is still raging. And these are topics that we'll go back to in a bit in a, later on. But Denise, would you like to share your intro remarks now? Right. Um, well, I think Nathan and Mary summed it up pretty well. Um, and obviously, the six months from the past year, the, all the protests uh, had solidified this community quite a bit. So even though we are in the midst of this pandemic and uh, you know, we, we have, it's actually getting a little bit better these days in Hong Kong, but still, you know, we are still social distancing and uh, the protests are not happening that much. So what I see right now is that um, you know, there is this sort of sense of frustration among the youngsters where um, you know, they would have this sort of anxiety that uh, you know, is the protest still ongoing? Because although you know, on the sentiments, it's, it's still ongoing, but uh, somehow for the young people, when they don't see you know all these groups of people on the streets they would worry so um you know there there's that going on 
And uh, also on the financial side of things, um, you know, it's, it's very good that we have the yellow economy, but still mm -hmm. I think we have a very difficult year coming ahead, uh, given that the, you know, the Beijing government, the Hong Kong government, is, you know, the suppression is really, really strong um, on people of our side. And you know, we can just foresee them trying, you know, going to all sorts of means to, uh, to, to block off uh, any sort of uh, funding that we might have. Um, specifically, you know, last year we had this uh, one of the, the funds um, that was generated by the public. Um, you know, they have been, they have their assets frozen. And uh, so, you know, that is something that is of concern, you know, um, given uh, we, we you know I am part of the other uh, humanitarian fund, the 612 humanitarian fund. And, uh, you know, we are seeing our um, funds going down quite a bit um, during these past months uh, with all the, the fees that we have been uh, paying. Uh, for the the people who have been affected, and also uh, you know, although we do have pro bono lawyers, but still you know there are some judicial fees that we are you know um, trying to uh, to to supply and to support the the people who have been arrested mm -hmm. and who are going through uh, this whole procedure. So uh, basically, you know, to give some numbers, we have been we have spent uh, over fifty million. Hong Kong dollars in the past uh, few months, um, and you know we we are foreseeing that we we will have to spend um, even more than that sum in the coming days, and so uh, you know that is in support of all these young people, you know, the six thousand or so people who have been um, uh, unjustly uh, arrested in the past year. And uh, that is actually quite worrying because somehow you know, we are taking up some of the responsibilities of uh, the government. Actually, you know that that is something that they should be providing, but mm -hmm. of course we cannot rely on them right now. So um, that that is uh, something that we have to face this year. And also, when you look at uh, all these. A uh, few newspapers, uh, say um, Apple Daily, Stand News, and uh, you know uh, Hong Kong Free Press. You know, we we are also facing very huge financial difficulties, uh, where you know, they don't have any revenue coming from advertisements. So uh, they do have some sort of subscription um, business models, but that actually cannot. Um, get them through a, a very, very long time. So with all these press and media uh, that is inclined towards the, the pro-government side, uh, you know, these few news outlets, you know, how can we uh, protect them? And then how can we um, to, to help them survive? Um, so I think these are the questions that we, we have to ask and we have to be aware of. Um, even with this pandemic, I, I mean, uh, we we recently had a few protests um, in shopping malls, and then you saw that all these police, the riot police, came um, for no reason, basically. So uh, you see that suppression is going to be even uh, worse than it was last year, and they would use any any tactics to 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 silence the people. So um, to 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 come in contrast with that, I think we on our side we have to be very very clever and very very flexible with all the tactics uh, and even maybe invent uh, and create more tactics than you know, what we had last year. Maybe we cannot rely on what we had last year anymore. Mm -hmm. I think this is a really good jumping point to our first question of the moderated conversation because I think you touched on a lot of very interesting and important topics. So uh, I was following the news in Hong Kong and I did mm -hmm. see how this past weekend several youngsters went to the mall and they were peacefully protesting, they were singing, and then all these yeah. Hong, Kong, <laughs> Hong Kong police just came over and they were so violent. I, I think one question that I want to pose to you to get this conversation going is having been on the ground for the protests over the summer and now that you're there, can you tell us a bit more exactly what these brave Hong 
Hong Kongers are fighting for. Why are they so frustrated with the Hong Kong government? Well, it all started with the anti-extradition bill um, that uh, people were very worried about uh, because if that bill passed, then uh, basically any person that the Beijing government did not like uh, could have extradited. And so, um, you know, fortunately, we um, were able to to push back this bill. But then, you know, a lot of other problems rose from you know, the 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 suppressed dust uh, that uh, the the Beijing and the Hong Kong government were trying to very hard to not let the Hong Kong people see. So, uh, you know, all this corruption. Um, from the Hong Kong government, the way that our chief executive officer, Carrie Lam, was dealing with all these problems, uh, basically ignoring all the voices of the people. And in the fundamental side, it's, uh, you know, the, the one country, two systems that we were promised is basically dead. So, um, you know, people, I guess people have uh, started to awaken since the umbrella movement. Um, but then we had a very difficult five years, and then this 2019 protest, uh, people just had a huge comeback, and so um, and we see we saw this uh, very renewed sort of um, flexibility in the protests, where you know we had this motto that is be water, and that transcribed to um, the ways that people. Uh, were mobilizing and also, uh, you know, the way that they were using the technology, uh, just like Mary had mentioned before. So uh, we had the six months of protests where um, I think it obviously amazed the world because nobody thought that you know, this very small place that, that is Hong Kong could have uh, fought for so long uh, against this huge machine that it is the, the Chinese Communist Party. So um, that's basically, you know, in very short, uh, what happened last year. And uh, maybe Nathan and Mary can elaborate more on this. Sure. Well, so it sounds like one country, two systems is obviously very much not working. It's deteriorating on multiple fronts, right? As the CCP continues to interfere in the city's affairs, and Carrie Lam slash the Hong Kong government is actively complicit in taking away. Hong Kongers guaranteed freedoms. Um, I know you mentioned this phrase about the flexibility, be water. And so with that mindset of be water, how do you see protesters utilizing innovative ways to use technology to their advantage? And Denise or Nathan, Mary, if any of you want to take this one. Yeah, I think like um, the motto of be water is not only um, an idea of how they conduct their protest, that they um, don't really, um, they have a lot of different forms, different tactics, and they don't really only keen, keen on certain one, that they adopt uh, different ways of protesting in accordance to their needs and to the difficulties that they encounter. But also we could see it from um, the way that they, they're using like online platforms, doing propaganda, uh, well, working against the Chinese propaganda doing their own promotion on like Facebook, Twitter, and we have um, observed or participated in uh, a series of like hilarious um, uh, like milk tea army um, battle on Twitter <laughs> that um, the, 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 the Thai um, netizens and also from Taiwan and from the places that um, are under the threat of CCP that they kind of like collaborated online and then go against the, the little pink that are sent um, in China, and they, they had to cross the huge firewall and then um, log on to Twitter and then to try to spread the, 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 the patriotic propaganda, me propaganda message. So I, I think that, that kind of alliance and, and the way that we collaborate on online platform, creating a community that's surrounded um, by uh, the, the mindset of combating CCP propaganda mm -hmm. has been really impressive and showing how creative and actually interesting the protest, the, the protest has been. Mm -hmm. So I think um, this is one of the examples like, to, to, to see how um, under the compression of space and time through the use of internet and also the globalization, 
that we could utilize these features of the internet to create a, a new community and then to work together um, with the people from all around the world. Mm -hmm. And also from um, one of the front line that I've mentioned, uh, the, 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 the election way, the election side, that we are now um, trying to use a lot of app or a lot of tools, online tools that could analyze and um, generate uh, uh, um, how the, 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 the public opinion looks like in order to better plan our, um, our like how we deal with the election, our, um, our master plan as uh, the pro-democracy camp, how we are gonna uh, arrange our teams on different districts and different mm -hmm. constitu uh, constituencies um, by analyzing those data. So these are also the things that um, through technology we could, we could better organizing mm -hmm. our power and, and, and what we have in order to um, get a better result in the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think I like how you mentioned the Milk Tea Alliance because I love it, <laughs> and that Twitter has an a really amazing space. Yeah, for I think that there are lots of uh, Taiwanese um, nationalists. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <in the> battle. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think it's really interesting how even though COVID is going on, we've been taking to the internet and creating new communities and new coalitions to fight back against propaganda. And uh, while I have you here, I've been following Demosisto closely since 2016, and I know that your group has been playing an instrumental role in assisting with mobilizing in this decentralized leaderless movement. And in this pandemic, we have seen how the world is seeing the China regime's true colors, right? So in China, they are censoring critical health information. They are arresting doctors, citizen journalists. They're really going through the pages of the authoritarian playbook on dealing with this. And so while I have you here, Nathan, I have a question for you. Uh, just a few weeks ago, we saw about 15 pro-democracy activists including father of democracy, Martin Lee, and Apple Daily owner, Jimmy Lai, arrested. What kind of message do you think the CCP and the Hong Kong government is trying to send to the public about this high-profile high arrest? Yeah, I think um, the CCP has been trying to um, exploit the pandemic situation in order to do the suppression uh, without much international attention and also um the like social distancing and the group banning in hong kong to prevent any huge backlash from uh their political suppression because um i think the, inter the international attention the pressure generated by um the countries all around the world especially like for example the legislation of the um hong kong uh human rights and democracy act mm -hmm. definitely play an important in a, an important role to um kind of like put pressure to the chinese government in order to um, relieve um, the, the the tension in Hong Kong and then to help um, building up a, a, a better coalition uh, around the world that to contain the expansionist aggression of the authoritarian CCP. But um, during the pandemic, uh, all these countries, they are working on their internal issues and are working on healthcare problems. And well, as a result, they spend less attention on global affairs, especially um, on like the operation of CCP and also the suppression in Hong Kong. So I think um, the CCP uh, tried to grab that kind of gap and uh, to exploit the, the, the attention, um, the, the lack of attention on Hong Kong during the pandemic in order to send a strong, very hawkish message to the Hong Kong public that they are, they are going after you, no matter how like, mild or how um, well-respected um, you are, um, during the uh, in those like fifteen um, uh, pro democracy figures that were arrested, um, there are several of them are really well respected, not only in the pro democracy camp but in the society as a whole. And I think um, in the old days, those uh, even like for the Hong Kong government, they they are not to arrest them to send a message because um, by arresting them, um, they they would well infuriate a lot of people in the society, not only from our camp, but mm. um, for those uh, which are more like are political. So I think um, the way that uh, the Chinese government has been um, putting pressure on Hong Kong during the pandemic shows um, that they, they are really aware of uh, how the, 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 the global communities has been watching Hong Kong and they wanted 
to exploit that moment that these um, countries uh, focus on their own stuff rather than what's mm -hmm. happening in the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. So basically, Beijing wants to tell the people of Hong Kong that no one is safe from getting arrested. And basically, Beijing wants to rule by fear. And yes, mm, I see. And I think this is a really good segue to talk more about the technology surveillance aspects. Um, Mary, I know you've reported extensively on this front regarding how the Hong Kong protesters have been really aware of uh, surveillance at the height of the movement. Can you elaborate on some of these? So, for example, the live streams back in over the summer and the double edged sword nature of them, and if they continue to concern protesters to this day? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think the, the Hong Kong protests um, over the course of last year, uh, we can safely say, uh, were one of the most, or possibly most likely the most live streamed protests um, the world has ever seen. Um, every single uh, day and weekend when the protesters were out, you had uh, hordes uh, of citizen journalists, uh, journalists from mainstream media outlets, from digital outlets, um, from more niche outlets out there in their neon yellow vests, live streaming on their phones um, and with their cameras and, and, and people who uh, either at home or even on the streets will pull up this live stream with a three by three grid of just a dizzying screen of nine different live streams going on at the same time. And this allowed um, people who may not necessarily be in the streets to uh, observe what's happening, to relay information back to whoever's out in the front lines, to tell them what's going on. Um, and it really helped uh, level the playing field a little bit. Of course, the police already are able to watch the live streams and they have uh, much better intelligence uh, through their large apparatus across the city. But I think for the protesters, uh, they were able to uh, leverage um, this, this aspect of technology to uh, really coordinate amongst themselves. I think on the flip side of that, of course, is that um, you, if you're trying to, uh, if you're trying to understand um, the protests only through the live streams, you do get quite a limited view. And so that, that's uh, definitely one drawback of that. And as we see uh, protests return, uh, Denise mentioned the protests um, over the weekend in, in shopping malls and live streams that was returned to that as uh, as tensions uh, picked up. And I, I certainly, I was not at the mall, but I certainly logged in to, to watch the live streams. I think we will see um, that dynamic play out and again, and, and whether the live streams will shape um, the protests as much as, as we go forward, um, depending on what shape uh, the protests themselves take, I think that's something definitely to look out for. Um, but um, just to go back to, a little bit to this uh, theme of uh, the pandemic uh, that Nathan mentioned just now uh, with the Hong Kong and China governments uh, using the cover of the pandemic to crack down a little bit more, I think just on this even a more micro level here, um, it's been very, very clear that um, the Hong Kong government and the police force has been selectively applying uh, the social distancing public health regulations um, to crack down on the protests. Um, of course, we right now we have a rule of um, no uh, public gatherings uh, of groups larger than four, uh, and amongst groups of four, you should have uh, 1.5 meters of distance. And so technically you could have socially distanced protests at malls where people are merely exercising their freedom of assembly and speech uh, by gathering in a mall and chanting some slogans, unfurling banners. Um, uh, but I suppose uh, opponents of these protests will say, well, given that there has been a precedent uh, of uh, some uh, protesters uh, smashing shops, the fact, the mere fact that people are gathering at malls means that there is a risk of that happening and hence the police will assume guilt, presume guilt before anything has happened and therefore deploy hundreds of riot police to forcefully disperse the crowds. Obviously, I don't think that kind of logic will hold any water in other jurisdictions, uh, but it certainly is right now here. Um, police are also saying that because protesters are gathering for quote, a common purpose, um, that uh, even, if, even if groups of four are more than 1.5 meters apart, that does not um, that actually doesn't shield them from um, uh, prosecution. Um, and, and to that, I would say, well, perhaps they can, the police can go to a beach where people are also gathering for the common purpose of enjoying beach time, and, and yet they're not dispersed. I mean, I would not want beachgoers to be dispersed uh, forcefully, but I think from there you can see the double standard very clearly that um, the public health regulations are being used 
selectively to crack down um, on the protest movement. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is a really good segue to our next question, and I'll let any of the panelists answer if you would like. Why do you think these ongoing pro-democracy demonstrations in Hong Kong have proven to be so resilient in the face of not only increasing Chinese oppression, but also COVID in this age of surveillance? Well, well I, th I think, sorry. Uh, no, then uh, <laughs> go first, yeah. Well, I, I think uh, one of the key points is that, you know, this sort of decentralization of this whole movement um, was very, very useful, you know, for the sustainability of the, you know, this this six months of protests, uh, because when you compare it to um, during the umbrella days, we had uh, you know a few organizations, uh, including Nathan. He was one of the student leaders um, who were you know so called calling the shots, and people were basically following um, you know these uh, instructions, and then uh, so it became very easy for them, you know, the government, to take down this whole movement uh, because mm -hmm. they would just be targeting these particular people or organizations. So last year, it was a completely different scenario where everyone was in control of the protest. You, know, you could just pitch an idea out there and then if someone thought it was a good idea, they would follow along and then something would, um, and a, mo a momentum would create from that. And then if that momentum died off, then something else could have happened, and then it would just, you know, uh, catch on. the the the, the whole the whole um, sentiment would just catch on. So uh, I think that is very very key, and that's also mm -hmm. what probably amazed and also inspired the world. You you saw all these other protests, um, you know, in in um, different parts of the 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 world where you know, they also deployed uh, similar tactics. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think you know, that's probably uh, why this could have um, uh, came into you know, the same level of strength to this huge machine uh, of CCP. Um, and also, you know, the, the, the fact that um, the communist government, they always rely on, uh, you know, fear. You know, they, yes. they try to scare people off and then they try to... Um, they try to make an example of one person and then so that the other people would back off. But then somehow, uh, amazingly, this generation of uh, Hong Kong youngsters, they are really, really resilient. And, uh, you know, they just would not back off. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, we are all really proud of them. And so hopefully, you know, this would continue on this year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think the decentralization aspect is so key and definitely so inspiring. Um, watching the news, you see all these Hong Kong youth going to the front lines and then just being able to work together seamlessly. Definitely grip yes. the attention of us at HRF and the world as well. And I know Nathan and Mary, I saw you guys wanted to chime in on this question. Go ahead, Nathan, I see. You. Yeah, I think um, um, like for the protest, participation there are several factors that uh, will mobilize it emotion is one of them we, we've been through a lot of grievances and anger um, mm -hmm. by witnessing tragedies and sufferings from our from our fellow citizens and and these emotions actually glue us together and then to really mobilize mobilize us on the street and then to like chant to release that kind of anger mm -hmm. but that kind of um stimulation sometimes is, is a a bit more temporary because um, emotions fade. But for the past like almost a year, we've been through another process of uh, identity building process that its influence will last long because um, with a new and emerging identity, you get sense of purpose um, by understanding who you are and uh, why you are there and who are your fellow citizens, who are the members in your community that you want to protect. So I think um, a, a large um, identity generating process had been happening for the past couple of months mm -hmm. by inventing, creating our like city anthem symbols and recognizing a lot of collective experience that made us feel like we are the same. And then we share our pain 
and our pride and also we want to protect the city and the people in the city so i think that kind of like consolidated identity is actually the cornerstone of why the the, the protest has been prolonged and um really energetic even though it's been like almost a year so mm -hmm. i think yeah that like then is definitely part of it because like the cultural influence influence Dennis had brought to the movement um contributing um her songs and her singings to the people who are like feeling hopeless and helpless and i think these are really um the things that cement all the things together and and build up the whole new identity uh, mobilizing one a resisting one and uh, another thing surrounded by the idea of um defending our own city um has been really salient in the in, in, in the ongoing movement mm -hmm. this is very strong i think um i've been following a lot of the news obviously and, and so this new identity is obviously this unique identity of hong konger is that correct yeah 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 hong yeah, yeah. the hong konger yes yeah. so the city anthem um i also know that our previous COVID con speaker francis we also spearheaded a we are hong kongers campaign here in the u.s for the census so i think it's very encouraging very energetic as this as this movement continues pre-covid during covid post-covid um mary do you want to chime in for this as well before i ask the next question Mm -hmm. Yeah, just uh, one other point I'd make is that um, in addition to the decentralized movement that I uh, mentioned and, and the, 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 the highly energetic and the, the, the gluing um, nature of, of the strong identity, there's also a, a, um, an effort at organizing a little bit and bringing some form of um, structure to the protest movement uh, with the organization of many, many newly um, established worker unions of, over the past uh, couple of months. And so in addition to people coalescing on the streets, you now have colleagues, uh, people working in the same industries, financial industries, for example, health workers, uh, creatives, people in architecture, uh, retail industry, service industry, um, hotel industry, and what have you. Uh, you have these sorts of identity groups forming also along uh, professional lines where people can now look out for each other and, and uh, stand up for each other uh, in the workspace um, and, and try to push back a little bit against um, what will inevitably uh, be uh, pressure from uh, 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 companies and bosses. And so that's another form of um, kind of just trying to balance out the, the leaderless uh, movement that we've seen with a little bit more organization in, in the form of these working unions. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like the three main things that I got from all of your answers were the decentralization, uh, that nature of the decentralized movement. The second one is how emotion has served as the glue, tying everyone together towards this cause, and also cross-sector alliances across various professions working together towards this goal. I wish I had a crystal ball to look into the future, but unfortunately I don't have one. But I do have the three of you. My last question, um, let's start with Denise. How do you envision right. the pro-democracy movement to evolve post-COVID? Right, uh, well, I mean, I don't have a crystal ball either. So I, uh, it's, it's really difficult to say how it evolved, but um, no, hopefully I, uh, I, I think that you know, we we can still ride on this mentality of be water, mm -hmm. and um, you know to really to to uh, to not hold on to anything that um, you know we we already accomplished because that was actually what helped people um, you know to 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 inspire them to to think of new ways because past the past year uh, we started out at a very low point post umbrella movement where people had all these uh, disappointments and frustrations. So because we sort of started from zero, then you know, people learned very fast and we had nothing to hang on to. But then right now, I think there's this, um, this challenge that we would be facing is that you know, we had this sort of um, accomplishment last year. And so uh, moving ahead, uh, can we let go of what we already 
have done and then you know try to find new ways and then try to um you know to 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 go with the flow and then to take things as they come uh, i think that is one of the key points that you know hong kongers have to remind ourselves of mm-hmm. you know, why we succeeded last year and also um you know i think uh, it is also a time where we have to diversify you know if we used technology and uh, you know the these means to mobilize people and then to have these all these protests on the streets um maybe the next step would be uh, you know to incorporate these protests this this uh, sort of uh, spirit of the protest into our everyday lives so meaning that um we cannot only rely on these street protests because that is actually quite exhausting when you look at all these youngsters yes. uh, i know quite a few of them and then you know when we went on to november and december they were actually quite exhausted yeah. but then they felt the need to you know i have to go on but then that is not sustainable so uh, how do we uh, take on you know their roles not not only depending on these youngsters to keep this fire going on but then uh, you know us as creators you know the people from the cultural side or actually anyone you know, basically anyone who believes in this um fight we have to use our space to um to to contribute to to this cause so mm-hmm. uh say for example me as a singer you know i i have um been reflecting these days uh, since you know we we don't have much going on um uh, uh with the social distancing so you know personally i have been reflecting on my role as a singer and i feel that i have not um contributed uh as much as i should have uh, given that you know i have given more time to the activist side of things last year so um this year i think i would use more of my time to you know to to uh, write songs and mm-hmm. to uh, basically uh, to to um, to contribute on this uh, uh, this sort of morale boost for the people. So I think this can um, this can adapt to you know, be adapted to any person. Basically, you know, if you're a writer or uh, you are a teacher, you know, just do anything you can in your space, and that is actually. You know, somewhat of a be water 2.0. <laughs> Thank you, Denise. I look forward to yeah. listening to your new songs. I'm sure they will yeah. be a great morale booster. Um, Nathan or Mary, any of you? Yeah, I think like other than um, the Legislative Council election and also uh, what's happening on the court and also the yellow economy, I think um, the situation of China would also be an influencing factor on mm-hmm. how the future of Hong Kong goes. Um, as um, the, 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 the global trends on the attitude towards China has been moving towards a more like doubting and aggressive side um, instead of a more appeasing and like trusting side, um, I think there will be more and more challenges imposed on the um, system that China has uh, always wanted to create, um, for example, the Belt and Road Initiative, um, also the the all the um, human rights oppression um, like engineered by them in Xinjiang, and so the intimidation on Taiwan, mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. And I think um, whether China could um, bear that pressure, the 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 way that the global community imposed on them, and then to sustain uh, enough in economic benefit to the people. Um, in order to gain their legitimacy, rather than um, giving them votes, uh, will be a crucial um, observation in the future on how they treat Hong Kong issue. And uh, it will also signify um, the importance of Hong Kong, whether it will fade or becoming more important, because um, um, China, they need a platform for um, like gaining liquidity, financial mm-hmm. service, professional service, and so on and so forth. So I think um, that kind of dynamic um, situation, that kind of um, uh, uh, the, 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 the way that um, the, the world sees China and deal with them uh, would definitely um, well be interesting to observe and to really calculate its, in, its influence towards the situation of Hong Kong. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think COVID has really shined a light on China and the global perception of China is definitely changing every single day. And I think it's safe to say that the CCP under Xi Jinping is starting to feel extremely threatened. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Uh, Mary, do you want to say a few words? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just building on that, um, I would say that I don't have a crystal ball, but uh, neither does China. And so I think last year with the protests, China was uh, caught flat-footed. Uh, whatever intelligence uh, was being ferried back to Beijing from uh, their offices here in Hong Kong uh, was not adequate enough for them to foresee this humongous upswell of popular discontent uh, where you had one in seven people come out and march on the Sunday. So the fact that they could not foresee that uh, tells us quite a bit about how much or how little of a playbook they have going forward even right now. And um, despite them coming out with this very forceful gesturing, uh, with saying things like, um, you know, the, the Hong Kong uh, uh, office here, the liaison office in Hong Kong, uh, can basically do as they please, uh, the uh, arrests of the 15 um, uh, veteran figures of the pro-democracy movement. These are all clear signs of them wanting to be more aggressive and it uh, goes in tandem with their increasing aggression on the diplomatic uh, uh, level as well with, for example, uh, their an essay on uh, the, the Chinese embassy's website in France accusing France of letting all people die uh, of COVID. Um, China, for example, threatening basically to um, economically boycott uh, Australia. These are very, um, kind of very much saber rattling aggressive moves. Um, but as to whether there will be a backlash against China, uh, I don't think any of us know, and uh, neither does China. And so I think that's that's something to keep in mind also. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Denise. That's Thank all the you. time we have for today. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to share that I think all the brave Hong Kongers, such as yourselves and everyone else on the streets, are extremely brave for standing up against authoritarianism. It's truly very inspiring. Uh, the Hong Kong government, the Chinese government, is weaponizing technology to crush dissent. But what we discussed today was a message to those autocrats, to Carrie Lam, to Xi Jinping, that when people stand together and creatively utilize technology for human rights, and for democracy, the output can truly be powerful. Although we are ending this panel discussion right now, feel free to continue the conversation on Twitter. Denise's handle is at H-O-C-C-G-O-O -O music, Hawk Gu music. Mary's Twitter is at Mary Hui, H-U-I. And Nathan's is at, at Nathan Law KC and at the Human Rights Foundation at HRF. Today's panel is one of Human Rights Foundation's many initiatives for our new Hong Kong desk. And what the Hong Kong desk does is that we raise further awareness about the CCP and the Hong Kong government's suppression of civil liberties by filing petitions, urgent appeals to UN Human Rights Council special procedures, producing research and reports to maintain international attention on the subject. Thank you all for joining today's panel. Once again, on behalf of the Human Rights Foundation, let's continue to think big and let's take action. Thank you. See you again soon. Thank you. Thank take you. Care.